Today, we have a fantastic opportunity to learn from Dr. Jenny Lisman, who's going to tell us about genetic anthropology. Has anybody ever heard of genetic anthropology before? You have? Okay. The rest of us are in for a treat, because we're going to learn about how we can see human history in spit. All right. So help me welcome Dr. Lisman to the podium. Thanks for having me today. I want to thank Science Saturdays and um, Dr. Ramirez for inviting me to come talk today. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk today about um, some of my research uh, as a genetic anthropologist or anthropological geneticist, um, whichever is easiest for you to say. It doesn't matter. Um, so um, anthropology is a, is a science. It's actually a social science. And it's the study of the origins and, and behavior of humans as a species. And in universities in the United States, anthropology is divided up into four subfields. Um, so what people commonly think of when they think of anthropology is probably cultural anthropology. So um, cultural anthropologists would study um, a particular group of people, a particular population. They might study their marriage practices, their um, uh, birth practices. Um, linguistic anthropologists study uh, languages, the, the differences and similarities between different languages. Archaeologists um, are anthropologists who use artifacts to, to study the origins of humans. So anything that, that a human population might have left behind, whether it's a garbage pile, or the foundation of a home, um, or fragments of pottery. And biological anthropologists, or physical anthropologists, which is what I am, use biological data to study the, the origins and, and behavior of humans. So um, anthropologists overall are interested in, in um, looking at the differences between human populations that you see today. Um, and trying to figure out how they got that way. So sort of looking at, at human variation, whether it's behavior or um, language or, or physical differences between human populations, and then trying to figure out what happened in the past to make, um, to make that variation, uh, to make us look the way we are today, to make, to make us behave the way we are today. Um, so there are different kinds of... Uh, different kinds of data that physical anthropologists can collect to try to um, understand uh, human history and, and how we got to be the way we are today. Um, these are pictures of, of some people who were my professors when I was in graduate school at NYU. And, and they each um, collect different kinds of, of data as physical anthropologists. So. Um, at the top, you can see somebody. Uh, this is, these are people who are working at, at a site in Tanzania where they are collecting fossils, and they're looking at um, they're collecting data from fossils to learn about uh, what human ancestors might have looked like in the past. Um, this is somebody who's an expert on um, teeth, human teeth, but also the the shapes of of teeth of of human ancestors and human relatives, like other monkeys and apes. Um, this is somebody who studies baboon behavior, um, specifically their mating behavior and, and uh, mating between different species of baboons. Um, this is somebody who's studying the behavior of other kinds of monkeys in South America. You can see he's almost up to his neck in water, and he's, he's, um, he's looking up into the trees because he's watching the behavior of, of the monkeys. Um, and uh, this, is, this was my advisor. This is a, in a genetics lab at NYU. And so this is somebody who uses genetic data to study um, both human populations, but also uh, populations of human relatives, so other, other monkeys and, and apes. Um, and this is somebody who is uh, she's digging um, at, a, at a site uh, for, for bones, for the remains of, of humans. Um, and she studies the, the shapes of, of the bones from different populations so that she can compare them to each other. So, so physical anthropologists um, want to 
look, typically look at uh, variation that you find in, in modern human populations and then try to use that information to piece together the past like, like a puzzle. Um, so uh, and you, you can use genetic information to do this, which is what I do. And this map um, of the world sort of shows um, some of uh, the timings of some of the ancient human migrations. So based on both evidence from fossils and from genetics, we've kind of been able to piece together uh, the history of, of ancient human migrations. And so what the, the numbers on this map indicate are the timings of some of the, the large movements of humans around the, the globe. So we know that humans as a species originated in Africa maybe close to 200,000 years ago. And at around 100,000 years, um, they, some human populations left Africa. They might not have gotten that far. But by 40,000 years ago, there were human populations in Europe and um, Central Asia and Australia. And then more recently, somewhere between 15,000 and 35,000 years ago, when there was more land exposed here because sea levels would have been lower at that, at that time if uh, there, were, there was more water locked up in glaciers. Humans could have walked across um, a, a land bridge here into the Americas. And this map is, is kind of simplistic. Um, you know, humans are constantly migrating and um, they don't uh, you know, move in just in one direction like these simple arrows would indicate they're you know, moving back and forth. And, and, but if you put all of the arrows that, that would really reflect all human migrations, you wouldn't be able to see the map anymore. So, um, so this is just a simplistic map showing some ancient human migrations that um, we've been able to, to figure out using both fossil evidence and genetic evidence. So um, genetic evidence comes from a molecule called DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. And um, some people may have already learned some about, something about it in school, and, and you may uh, hear about it in uh, the news or on the Discovery Channel or things like that. Um, so I'm just going to do a, a really quick review of, of what DNA is. Um, so it's, it's a molecule that has two strands that are sort of wound together into this helix. And in the middle, you can see what looks like the rungs of a ladder. So the, the rungs are made up of four smaller molecules, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. But I'm just going to say A, T, C, and D. And what you'll notice is that A always goes with T, and G always goes with C. They always match up with each other on, this, on the rungs of the ladder. And the DNA is, um, it sort of contains the, the instructions for your body. Um, it, it's in every cell of your body, and it, and it contains like a, a code of instructions um, that tells your body how it's supposed to grow and what kind of cells, new cells it's supposed to make, what kind of proteins it's supposed to make, and where those proteins should go. So um, the, the DNA in one cell, if it were all unwound and stretched out, would be about eight feet long. So it has to, and you have about 100 trillion cells, I think, in your body. So the, the DNA has to be packed really, really tightly to fit into all the cells. Um, of your body. So, so it's wound into a double helix, but then it sort of winds up on itself, and it's packed into this um, a unit called a chromosome. This is kind of the packaging unit of the DNA. And the chromosomes are in the nucleus. The nucleus is in the middle of the cell, and then you have about 100 trillion of these cells in your body. And every cell in a person's body has basically the same, the same DNA. Um, and humans have 46 of these chromosomes, of these packaging units, in, in every nucleus of their cell. Um, and you get, half of, you get half of these chromosomes from your mother and half of these chromosomes from your father. Um, so all humans have, have 46, but if you're a girl, you have, two, you have two X chromosomes. And if you're a boy, you have one X and one Y chromosome. So when, um, 
so you, you, may, you may have heard things on, again, on the Discovery Channel or in the news, things to the effect that, that all humans pretty much have the same DNA, that we're about 99.9% um, the same as far as our DNA goes. Um, but there, so there are these tiny differences, about 0.01%, and that doesn't sound like a lot, but um, the human genome has about 3.3 billion of these letters. So 1% means that, 0.01% um, means that there are about 3 million um, small differences between each person um, in, their, in their genes. And uh, the way this happens is that whenever a cell divides, whenever a cell makes a copy of itself, um, for example, when a sperm cell or an egg cell is being made, the DNA has to unwind, the helix has to unwind, and um, it has to copy itself. So two new strands have to be made to make two, two separate um, new DNA molecules from the original DNA molecule. And when, um, when the new strands are being made, sometimes there's a typo. So sometimes it doesn't copy itself exactly, and there's a, there's a small mistake. Um, so for example, if, if uh, your parents' DNA had, had a sequence um, like this, every once in a while there's a mistake. So here's a G that was put in instead of an A. Now, the, the, um, the DNA molecules in the nucleus of the cell have, there are all kinds of proteins that are floating around the DNA and that are attached to the DNA when it's, um, it's copying itself. And some of those proteins are like a built-in um, correction mechanism. So when, when these typos pop up, um, usually they're actually fixed before they would ever see the light of day. But, but every once in a while, they're not fixed. And they make it through to the, the new egg or sperm cell. And they're permanent. Um, once there's a typo like that, then it becomes part of, of the, the baby that's born. And, and that person has that typo in every cell of their body. And that typo can, gets passed down to their children. So um, let's say a baby was born 1,000 years ago with a particular typo. Um, every, every descendant of theirs, uh, their children and their grandchildren, has a chance of, of having this typo. So um, yeah? Well, so you, we, what we do is we use these typos to, to tr you can trace them back, sort of like following the breadcrumbs to find your way back home. So because these typos are, are permanent, and they're not necessarily bad, just because it's a mistake in the copying of, of the DNA, it doesn't mean that, um, that they're actually a bad thing. Most of them are, are random, and they don't necessarily affect your health. Um, but they're just a record. Uh, that we can use to, to see who's related to who. Because what happens is because the, the, um, these changes are, are permanent, and then they can be passed down to future generations, then when you, when you look at a population today, everybody who shares the same um, version of, of the typo, that shares that piece of DNA. They're, they're all related so in some way. So that bunch of people are all Yeah, so that's, that's the kind of evidence that we use to figure out how individuals are related to each other and how populations are related to each other. Um, so, so the work that I do, um, even though I'm, I'm uh, looking at, um, at DNA, I concentrate on these typos um, when, when I collect data from DNA. Um, and I want to collect a large number of, of I want to collect information on a large number of these typos um, because you can't just use information from, from one of these uh, typos to determine how people are or are not related to each other. You need a lot of, of independent pieces of, of data 
um, to, to determine that. Um, so I would normally try to collect uh, data from all the different chromosomes, from all um, 23 sets of chromosomes, and look for, look for these um, typos, which we call SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs. Um, and I, I would collect data from all 23 chromosomes. So scientists, in general, uh, want to collect data that's, that's independent. Um, that means that, uh, so for example, if, if you uh, wanted me to give you some information about Justin Bieber, and you wanted uh, three pieces of inf information about um, Justin Bieber, I could tell you. He's a boy, and um, he's, he's male, and he's human. But that's not really three separate pieces of information, because uh, by telling you that he's a boy, I, I kind of already told you that he's male and he's human. Um, so if you wanted three separate pieces of information about Justin Bieber, I might tell you he's a boy, and um, he's famous for his haircut, and uh, there's a 3D movie about him. So th that's three pretty, pretty much separate pieces of information about him. So when I collect data on SNPs, I want the SNP data to be from all 23 different chromosomes. So the, I don't want them to be SNPs that are right next to each other on the same chromosome, because sometimes the information is redundant. And the, the populations that, that I've done a lot of work with um, have actually been, um, they, they live right now in Thailand. So the populations that I study are tribal populations. Um, they're relatively small populations that live in Thailand, but also in other parts of Asia. So these are populations that are migratory. That means they, um, they move around a lot, and they move from one country to another, and they've been moving for thousands of years. And that's part of what makes them interesting to me, because it's hard to know where they came from. And um, their, their histories, um, until maybe a couple hundred years ago, were not written histories. They didn't, their languages, um, they didn't have uh, written languages. So their histories were passed down uh, from one generation to the next just through stories. So there's, there's no, because there's no written histories of these, um, of these tribal populations in, in this part of Asia, um, there's a lot of speculation about where they came from. And people can interpret these oral histories very differently depending on what their kind of interests are, you know, what they, what they want to make out of the stories. So um, for some of these tribal populations, there are theories like they're the lost tribe of Israel or they came from Siberia. Um, sometimes people uh, think that um, you can use their languages to determine where they came from. So if their languages seem really similar to the languages of people from a particular part of Asia, then people might think, well, they must have come from that place too. But there are different ways for languages to be passed on, so that's not necessarily true. Um, so, so Thailand is, is all the way over here, and, and um, we're here. So I would travel to Thailand to, to collect um, saliva samples from individuals of these tribal populations. And um, I didn't really want their spit. I wanted their, their DNA. Um, but um, there, there's a lot of DNA in, in your saliva. So um, people may be familiar with the idea that you can scrape the inside of your cheek to, to get a DNA sample, because you're scraping the cells off the inside of your cheek. And um, in people's saliva, there's some of these cells, too. Some of the cells on the inside of your cheek, they're constantly dying and you're constantly making new ones, so that's in your, in your spit. But there's also a lot of white blood cells in your spit. And so, um, so the saliva is a, is a pretty good source um, for DNA. And um, I, so I would, I would go to Thailand, and I'm just going to pass this around. This is the kind of kit that I use to um, collect a saliva sample from somebody. So um, you, could just, you could pass this around. But I don't want anyone to spit in it, because I don't need your spit today. Um, so there's, inside this kit, there's, um, there's some liquid. And when you, people spit in the, in the bottom part of the container, and then I twist the lid on, and there's liquid in the, in the top of the lid that mixes with the saliva. And there are some preservatives in the liquid 
that, um, that keep the DNA intact. So DNA actually, um, once it's, it's out of the cell, it degrades over time. It falls apart. Um, and things like heat or water can make it fall apart faster. Um, and because I was going to be traveling around Thailand and I wasn't going to be near a refrigerator or a freezer, and um, where, where I was going in Thailand, it's either, it's either really hot or really, really hot. So um, I'd be driving around in like 120 degree weather and then you, know, you put these on an airplane and they are going to freeze. So, so there's a preservative in there that keeps the DNA intact even when it's going through all of these temperature changes and it's not being refrigerated or frozen. Um, and, and this uh, device is something that has been around for maybe um, five or seven years. And before that, it was, it was a lot more difficult to, to get a good DNA sample out of saliva. So um, people were relying a lot more on blood samples. But it's, um, it's a lot harder to convince somebody to, um, to volunteer to be stuck with a needle than it is to, to volunteer to spit into a container. So, so this, um, being able to get a really good DNA sample out of, out of saliva makes this kind of work a lot easier because it's just um, much easier to, to get people to, to cooperate um, to spit into the container. But even, even that, it takes a good like 15 minutes for somebody to really fill up the, the kit. And um, sometimes people get embarrassed and they don't want to have to spit in front of other people. So they sort of walk off and um, uh, you know, they try to find some privacy to do their spitting. <laughs> Um, so, so the part of Thailand that, that I would go to to collect these saliva samples was way in the north. And I don't know if you can sort of see on the map how, how bumpy it looks in this region. It's pretty mountainous up here. And the tribal populations that live up here in the mountains, like I said, they live in, in all of these other countries. They live in China. But they move back and forth across the borders into Thailand. And they've been in Thailand for you know, some of them anywhere from 50 years to, to a couple hundred years, but they've been migrating through Asia for the past few thousand years. So, um, so these, are, uh, these are language groups of some of the populations that live in Asia. And the tribal populations that I'm talking about are, are over here. So I collected samples from five tribal populations, Hmong, Karen, Akka, Lahu, and Lisu. And so this is sort of like a family tree of their languages. And it doesn't necessarily mean that, that um, the, the family tree, their genetic family tree, is going to match up to this at all. Um, so, so there are um, some of the populations, some of the tribal populations have languages that are pretty similar to each other. And there's one population, the Hmong, that whose language is really um, an isolate. It's, uh, linguistics don't really know how to categorize it. Um, so they keep moving it around from different categories. You know, every 20 years, it's recategorized by, um, by linguists as something else. But, um, but it seems really problematic to categorize it. So, but I, I collected samples from, from all five of these tribal populations. But I also collected samples from people who say that all four of their grandparents are Thai, and from people who, who say that all four of their grandparents are Chinese. There are plenty of people living in Thailand who, um, who have Chinese ancestry, um, particularly in Bangkok. So, so I also have samples from, from those individuals. So, um, so to collect these samples, I would have to, I, I went a number of times to Thailand, and I would have to go all the way into the north, into these mountains. So um, this was like my office. Um, it's a rough job, but uh, uh, it looks like a painting, but it's real. So I would wake up in the morning, and this is what I would see. And then um, we'd set out. I, I, when you do this kind of work, um, particularly in another country, you can't do it by yourself. You can't just land somewhere and, and uh, ask people for their DNA. You need to get permission from your university in the United States. You need to get permission from a local university in the country that you're working in. And you need to get a lot of people, a lot of local people, to help you. Because you don't know where you're going, and um, you need translators. And when you're working somewhere like this, um, 
to get into the mountains, the, you can only go during part of the year. That's uh, when it's the dry season, because during the rainy season, the roads wash out, and there are mudslides. So, um, so you really need like an expert driver to take you there. And you need to go with somebody who knows where they're going and who knows where it is or isn't safe. So, um, so we'd go into the mountains. The, the, the tribal populations that I was dealing with are farmers. And you can, you can see uh, on the mountainside some of the, the crops that they have um, planted. Um, and here they, they've cut. They've, um, this is something a kind of farming called terracing, where they've cut into the side of the mountain. So it's, it's really hard to farm. Um, on a steep mountainside, so they they cut slices into the mountain to make like multiple flat areas for their for their farming. And the, there are these little villages that are dotted all over the mountain ranges. Um, and so, like I said, the it's it's pretty hard to navigate around there. Most people have motorbikes; they don't have cars. So these are some of the, the people who, who helped me. I had the, th the three people in the middle are nurses who would go with me and who were my translators. Um, and these were two um, forestry rangers, forest police, who knew the area really well, and they were with us. Um, and this guy actually ran um, health clinics for a lot of the, the people who gave me saliva samples. So he basically personally knew everybody who um, who we came in contact with, and that was really helpful. Um, so, so we were staying, um, for this particular trip, we were staying at a forestry station at the, the top of the mountains. So we'd pack up our truck in the morning with our supplies, including the, the spit collection kits. Um, and we'd uh, drive around to get to the villages, but sometimes the truck overheats and you just have to um, that's one thing that you learn when you're, you're working um, uh, somewhere, when you're not working in the United States, and, and you realize you have to go with the flow. That things so you make a plan for the day, but it just doesn't always work. And then you gotta, you gotta move to plan B really quickly. So, um, so we'd land in, in these villages, and the villages had been contacted beforehand by the people who were working with me. So they, they knew that we were coming, and um, these villages typically have one man who's elected for the year to be kind of in charge of the village. So if, if um, my assistants contacted a village and the headman said, you know, we're not interested in participating, we don't want you to come, then we just we wouldn't show up. Uh, so, so all the villages that we visited knew that we were coming, and they knew what day we were coming. And so, so each village typically has some kind of um, central area where people get together and meet and um, you know, talk. They may have their, their meetings there. They may have religious services there. So we would kind of park ourselves in this central meeting place. And that way, um, people could, if they were interested in participating, they could show up. Um, and if they, if they didn't really want to participate, they could just stay home. They could avoid us. This, we decided that this was better than going door to door and sort of confronting people, and then they might, they might say yes, even if they didn't really want to say yes. And that's kind of putting a lot of pressure on people. So we decided it was better to just hang out in one place, and people could, could um, participate if they wanted to and, and avoid us if they didn't want to. So um, we had consent forms that were in Thai, and these were explained to people. But um, most of the people don't read or write. Uh, so they, had to, they would sign the consent form um, by putting their thumbprint on it instead of their signature. Um, and then people would line up and, and start spitting in the, in the collection kits. <laughs> they're, work, these, they're working really hard. They really are. <laughs> this is my favorite. <laughs> my favorite picture. I wanted to frame it and put it up in my house, but my kids did not want me to do that. I guess I'm used to looking at it, so it doesn't bother me. Um, so, so people would start spitting in, in, the, in the containers, and then sometimes um, they, would, they, would all, they would all start coming up to me and handing me these containers really fast, and there'd be like a backlog of spit 
um, you would be screwing the, the tops on really quickly, but you have to make sure that you screw them on you know, really carefully so they don't leak out when you're taking them home on the airplane. So, um, so I'd end up with, with a bunch of, of uh, saliva collection kits. And No, so, so, you know, it depends what kind of study you're doing. Um, I didn't, this was, um, I was collecting anonymous population samples. The only thing that I needed to know from these people um, was, are you at least 18 years old? Are you agreeing to do this, you know, of your own accord? And um, are all four of your grandparents from this particular tribe? Um, I didn't want to know anything else about them. So if you're doing a medical genetic study where you really need to trace certain information about, like, what kind of disease somebody has and how sick they are back to a specific DNA sample, you'd have to label it. And I didn't, I didn't have to do that, yeah. So, um, so when you get the, the DNA um, back to the lab, and, and even, even this was tricky, the, the first time that, that I went um, was before the shoe bomber. And part of this work was for my doctoral thesis. So I had spent about two years writing grants, and, and then I traveled to the other side of the planet, and I collect the saliva samples. So when I brought them back with me on the plane, I put it all in my carry-on luggage. I had about, the first time I went, I had a couple hundred um, saliva samples, and I packed them all into my carry-on bag, and I figured, you know, the airlines can lose the rest of my luggage that I check, but I need this spit. Um, and, and I never got stopped. I don't, I rarely get stopped in airports. I guess I don't look scary. So um, no one ever really stops me to look through my luggage. But I was thinking, and I had a lot of paperwork with me to try to explain it if somebody did look through my luggage. But I got lucky nobody looked. But then um, after that, between that, then and the next time that I went, um, there was the shoe bomber incident. So you could no longer bring liquids on a plane. And I was terrified. Um, the next time I came back, what am I going to do with my spit? I have to actually check it in the luggage, and I was really scared that, you know, what happens if the airline loses my precious spit? So I, I divided it up into two different suitcases, and I put half from each village in, in each suitcase so that even if one entire suitcase was lost, I would still have um, a sample from, from each village to, to get the, the geographic range that I had worked so hard. Um, to get. So, so then you, you come back and you have, um, you know, it's really exciting to, to be able to collect all of these, um, all of these samples, but then you have to open them and, and um, it can be a little gross, okay, but, but, you know, you're excited because you really want to get the DNA out of it. So, um, so when you're motivated, it's not as gross. So in the lab, you have to, you have to take the saliva out of the little kit and put it in a test tube and add some chemicals to it to make the cells burst open so that the DNA will come out of the cells. And um, you, add different, you add different chemicals to the, the tube than to get rid of the protein. Um, and DNA, the molecule DNA, um, likes water. It's happy around water. Um, so you pour alcohol into the tube. Um, and the DNA molecules are, it's almost like they're, they're afraid of alcohol, they need to avoid the alcohol, so they all sort of um, clump together to get away from the alcohol, and they form um, this blob, and this is really what it looks like. You can see this big blob, you know, hopefully, of, of DNA appear in the tube, like a cloud, and that's always a wonderful moment. Um, so it's really exciting after you've, you've you know, traveled that far and, and you've worked so hard to collect these samples and um, you pour the alcohol into the tube, you shake it back and forth a few times and then poof, there's a big um, cloud of DNA. Every once in a while there's a sample that just sort of stinks, it just fails. And, you know, somebody gave you a lot of spit but they just, there's not a lot of DNA in the tube and so you turn it back and forth you put, after putting the alcohol in it and you're waiting, you're waiting for that cloud of, of DNA to appear and it just sort of doesn't. Um, but no, no, it's, it doesn't kill it. No, it's, just causing, it's just causing it to form a clump, and then you can put it in a centrifuge and, and spin it down to make the clump go all the way to the bottom of the tube so that you can, you can extract the, the DNA from, from the tube. How many samples? So in total, I, I went 
I mean, I've been to Thailand about eight different times um, to work on, on these projects. Um, but I think only three of them, for only three of them, I was collecting samples. So I have a little over 500 samples so far. So, um, so like I said, uh, when, I, when I get these samples, there, there are many different ways to collect information on the SNPs, on the typos. And I'm not going to go into the details of that right now. Um, but, but I collected information on about uh, 2,500 of these little typos um, all over uh, the genome from all 23 chromosomes. And, um, and I had that information, like I said, on, on the samples that, that I had collected in Thailand. But um, there are also databases. There are public databases that anybody can access. You don't have to be a researcher, and, and it's free. You don't have to pay for it. So there are public databases that have the same kind of information on, on these typos for many different populations that have been collected from all over the world. So I was able to combine the information that I had collected with information from these public databases um, using populations, many other populations from, from Asia. And that was really helpful to me because um, then I could, I could compare um, my populations to the, all of these other populations from all over Asia to try to figure out um, which of these other populations, which of the other Asian populations do, do my populations look the most like genetically, um, and, and which ones do they, do they not look alike. So uh, you can also see things like um, migration between populations. You can, uh, you know, a, lo a lot of populations, a lot of human populations um, have cultural rules like you only marry somebody from within your, um, your particular culture or your grandmother's going to kill you, right? So, um, and there are a lot of populations that claim that that's what they do, but there's no such thing. I mean, all human populations are constantly um, migrate. There's constantly migration between all human populations. There's no such thing as an isolated population or a closed population, even if that's what um, people say. So, um, so one thing that you can uh, look at with this kind of information is the extent um, to which there's a discrepancy. So all of these populations um, claim that you know, you're only supposed to marry within the tribe. But then when you look at the genetic data, you can really see how much a movement there is between these populations and how, how um, much sort of trading there is um, going on between the populations of, of trading of people between the populations. Um, so one thing it, you can see, you know, the relationships between their languages. So one thing that's true is that um, if you if you can't speak someone else's language, it's not likely that you're going to marry them and have kids with them. It just makes it a lot more difficult. So um, when people speak languages that are, that are more similar, you'd expect that it would be easier to learn the other person's language. And there's going to be more movement between populations that have similar languages. Um, and and that, is, that is some of, some of what um, you find. So one thing that, that I found was that all of these populations um, are uh, Southern Asian in origin compared to Japanese. The Japanese population was one of the populations that I was able to get from um, the public database. Um, and then I also found that, that out of the, the five tribal populations that I looked at, these four are um, more similar to each other and this, this one population, the Hmong, are sort of outliers. Um, so even though all of these populations are, are Southern Asian in origin, the Hmong seem to be an outlier compared to the rest of these uh, tribal populations. And their language is also an outlier. So it's really difficult for the people of these other groups to be able to speak the Hmong language. And it really does seem like that ends up being a barrier for um, people moving back and forth between those populations. Um, one other thing that I found is that out of all five of the tribal populations, these two, the Lisu and the Lahu, um, are genetically most similar to each other. So even though um, the Lahu language is closer to the Aka language, um, these two have a lot in common genetically. And um, there's, there's not really, uh, there's no way to know whether that's because um, they, they originally um, were very different and that they've shared a lot, uh, that there have been a lot of people moving back and forth 
recently? Um, or is it because um, this, this similar, similarity in language between Atha and Lahu is not, um, that, that maybe one of them adopted the language sort of after the fact. So maybe their languages are really similar, not because they, um, they're genetically similar, but because one of them um, adopted the language at, at a later time. Um, but, the, but it is true that out of these um, three populations, um, their languages are similar enough that a lot of the men do speak um, one or more of the languages of the other populations, and they do a lot of business and trading with each other. So that's the kind of thing that increases the chance that they're going to also be trading marriage partners between the populations. So that's, that is actually what you see. Um, and another interesting thing that I found was that even though overall um, all of these populations are, are generally Southern Asian in origin compared to the Japanese, there's a small um, piece of ancestry in the Karen population that actually um, looks a lot like the Japanese. Um, and, and Japan is pretty far away from, uh, from where these people are living right now. So that could be one, explain, one possible explanation for that is that um, the, is that the, the ancestry in the Karen that looks a lot like the Japanese is a remnant of an ancient population that um, maybe from the area of Tibet, and that um, when people were migrating north um, to, to Japan, um, part of the population that, that eventually contributed to the Japanese was incorporated into what's now, um, what's now the, the Karen population. But so, so some of, um, um, when, when you do this kind of work, when you're taking uh, data or information from populations that exist today, and then you're trying to extrapolate the past, you're trying to figure out the past, you, you're ne you can never be totally sure. You can come up with probabilities, you can come up with inferences, but, um, and, and you can come up with theories that, that, make, that make sense considering what you're looking at today, but you can never be totally sure about um, what you're piecing together. Um, but, but for me, um, uh, just doing this kind of work in of itself is um, just interesting enough for, for me. But there are some applications to, to this kind of work. So um, aside from being able to make really good uh, Discovery Channel movies out of it, um, so, so there, there are, you know, you, some of you may have heard of, of companies that you can um, use like the same kind of, of spit kit and, and they'll tell you about your genetic ancestry. Um, so the same kind, so some of the same kind of work that I do, they're, they're using the same kind of data and these companies are using the same kind of data and the same kind of computer programs and um, um, statistics that, that I would use. They're using those same kinds of things to, to give you information about your ancestry. Um, but, but this kind of information is also applicable now to um, personalized medicine, which is something that we keep hearing about in the news as this thing that's going to happen, that, that's um, you know, about to happen, but hasn't totally happened yet. Um, so, so information about, about ancestry um, is, is also applicable to, um, to medicine, um, which, is, which is why I actually work, even though I'm trained as an anthropologist, I work at Yale in the psychiatry department in a psychiatric genetics lab where they're doing studies on the genetics of different kinds of psychiatric illnesses and different kinds of um, substance abuse disorders um, because they, they need to know a lot about the ancestry of the, the individuals that, um, that they're working on in the lab. Um, so that's, that's about it, but I'll take questions if people have them. Away. Let's uh, first of all. Uh, this is a little gift from us. It's oh, signed Saturdays. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? First of all, don't go away because I have an announcement. Okay, so let's ask some questions and uh, and then we'll get to the second part. Right there. Could you say that again? Yes. Yes. 
Oh, okay. This, this is, a, this is um, just a language that's related to Japanese. Um, it's just showing the relationships between some of the, the language families here. But um, I didn't include individuals from who, who speak that branch of Japanese. Um, um, that's not really likely because um, you see it um, even, even when you take samples of Karen from multiple locations. So, so one thing um, that can happen is if you, if you sample a population from one location um, and, and you assume, okay, this is going to represent, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to sample Karen from one village. and. And then you make the assumption that that represents Karen genetic diversity no matter where Karen are, even though there are Karen living all over Asia. That could be a mistake. You could end up just getting a picture of, of this one village um, that, you know, so maybe some Japanese people just landed in that particular village. So, so you'd be making a mistake. So one thing I was really careful to do is to get samples from multiple villages for every population that I collected. I um, I went to multiple villages, but also I can I can go back um, from different provinces in in Thailand, from different so from different mountain ranges, um, where it would be okay. So so I I was in um, this mountain range over here, and also this mountain range over here. So um, so it's just. If, you're, if you end up seeing the same picture from multiple villages, then, um, then you could be pretty sure that, that you're looking at something consistent and that's, um, that's representative of the population as a whole. A right, right. Could that be typo would be a normal process? Otherwise, we'll all be the Oh, yeah. So, so it, is, it is a normal process. Every time. Um, a cell divides, there's potential for these typos to occur, and they do occur, but like I said, most of them are actually fixed before they ever, um, in, before they ever make it into, into a baby. But um, the, these typos occur all over the genome, and they, so most of the genome doesn't make up proteins. Most of the genome does not contain information to create proteins. So, so these are just, um, they're not necessarily affecting anybody's health or the color of anybody's hair, but, but I can use them as a record of, of the past. There are plenty of SNPs that do cause differences between the way people look or between um, you know, people's health or between you know, how tall or short somebody is, but those are not the kinds of SNPs that I'm, that I'm looking at. Um, so, I for this particular study, I I only um, wanted to look at Asian populations. So even though the e even the populations that I used from the database were were um, just from Asia, but um, SNPs accumulate in in populations over time. So um, so one of the things that that you find um, is that not not for an individual necessarily, but if you look at the population as a whole. Um, because humans originated in Africa, African populations overall um, contain more genetic variation than non-African populations. And that's one of the ways that we know that, that those are older populations, because the, the variation accumulates over time, over generations. Um, so I didn't include African populations in this study, but it's been shown uh, repeatedly that African populations contain more more of these SNPs, um, more genetic variation overall than non-African populations. Yeah. And that's a function of how old the populations are. Okay, one more question. Um, why was I in Right, why, so a lot of people ask me that. So why, why was I in Thailand? Um, I'm interested in, in uh, answering theoretical questions. Um, so I had an opportunity to go do this study in Thailand because 
the lab that I was working with, the, the psychiatric genetics lab that I was working with, was doing a study, um, starting a study in Thailand on the genetics of opiate abuse and methamphetamine abuse um, in cooperation with the Thai government and, and with some, some universities in, in Thailand. Um, and so they, were, they needed to work with Thai populations and they needed information on the genetic ancestry of these populations and you know, how, how they're related to each other because they, they needed that for their further studies. So I was sort of able to tack on my, um, my work for uh, my doctorate to, to what they were doing. But if, they, if, if I had had an opportunity, if, if somebody had come to me and said, you know, we want to study the genetics of psoriasis in South American tribal populations, I would have said, well, I'll go there. You know, I, um, I mean, for me, um, I, I want to answer the theoretical question. So these happen to be good populations to work with. Um, and Thailand is a great place to go, and the food is fantastic, and it was really beautiful. And so, so, right, I mean, you saw those pictures. So I would get there, and I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm working. I'm, it's so hard, you know, um, while I'm eating fruit that was just picked off a tree. Um, so, uh, you know, I was just really lucky. I was re really lucky that I had that opportunity. But I would have gone, I would have gone somewhere else. Well, great. These are great questions. Uh, let's thank our th speaker again.